Good morning. Our uh, lesson text, oh actually, uh, well our lesson text is going to come from 1 Samuel chapter 8 and then there's a reading in chapter 9. And uh, in the Bible class here we've been studying about the life of Samuel and there's a lot of interesting things about Samuel. And uh, usually when we think of the book of Samuel there's just a couple of things we think about of Samuel, you know, his mother Hannah, we think about um, you know, them wanting a king, and so this is what we're about here today. Uh, although the chapter's in here, uh, the actual reading of the text, and we actually are uh, kind of following this book here, which by the way, I guess, does anybody need a book? <laughs> uh, we've been doing this every week, so probably everybody already has one, so you're good. That's all right. Okay. All right, but the lesson here is on page um, uh, 39 uh, in the book here, but this is the main book we want right here, okay? All right. And it's good to have Bob back with us. Uh, he was feeling not feeling too well coming back from Michigan, as you might imagine, about 20 degrees, I think he told me. Um, but anyway, so that's why I'm teaching here. But he says he feels good enough to preach tonight, so uh, that'll be good. But we're glad he's back, glad Grace is back, and uh, I'm glad you all are here as well. All right, but anyway, we want to start this lesson tonight, or this morning, uh, from the book of Deuteronomy because uh, Moses spoke about these things about 450 years before they happened. And when we, when we read here in 1 Samuel, uh, is the fulfillment of what Moses spoke about a long time ago. And so if you have your Bibles, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And we're going to begin in verse 14. And, uh, and actually, before we start reading all that, uh, what, what does a king do for a people? What, do, what is the purpose of a king? in civil government. Yeah, he rules them. What would you say? Take their money? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take their money. What's that? Take their people. Uh, what else? Uh, civil government. Protect. That's what I was looking for. Another one, you know. Takes care of the people. Protects them. What was that? The final, final authority. Okay. All right, think about all those things, and that's true. Uh, we look to that maybe in a president, a king, uh, a ruler, a civil government. But when we think about the spiritual people of God, who should fulfill those roles? God. And who better can fulfill those roles? God. Uh, who can better protect a people than God? Who can better provide for a people than God? Who can better... Um, rule over people than God? Who is a better authority than God when it comes to those things? And so they're demanding a king, and we've looked at some verses on this, especially in this lesson on Samuel, but they're demanding a king like the nations around about them is really uh, um, an affront to God. It's really, a, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it's disrespecting God. It's really a rejection of God. It's like, you know, we, we don't want you. Uh, and, but when you look at the history of them, of course, God was much more patient, much more long-suffering than they or we, for that matter, deserve. But yet God took them out of Egypt, led them across the Red Sea, uh, watched over them in the wilderness wanderings and so forth. And so God had been with them, had protected them quite a bit. And we're going to read some stuff here in a moment about, uh, you know, what brought that on and so forth. But, but them demanding a king uh, is a, just a slap in God's face, you know, because God is to be that. All right, but in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14, uh, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Notice Moses says, when you come to the land and when you say this. He's not saying if, but he's saying when. And uh, just a side note on prophecy, a lot of times we think of prophecy made in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. But there's a lot of prophecies made in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the Old Testament, and this is uh, one such prophecy. Verse 15, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. Uh, one from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But you shall not multiply uh, horses for himself. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return again that way. What were the purpose of horses back in this day? Why not multiply horses? War, right. Horses were used for war back then. Uh, donkeys were the main riding, riding animals, if you will, transportation. 
And, and a war horse, that was like, you know, that was like a tank nowadays in, in combat. Uh, that was a feared thing. And, uh, you know, we read about horses and stuff figuratively and literally uh, in battle and su such. But again, don't multiply horses because then you'll be tempted to rely on that for strength rather than the Lord. Neither, verse 17, neither shall he multiply wise for himself, lest his heart turn away, uh, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. All right, now what, why would a king multiply wives? What was often the, uh, the motivating factor in taking a wife in a kingly situation? Heirs. Heirs, why else? Alliances, that's it, man, alliances. Uh, and you know, even what limited things I know about European history, you know, some of these English kings would marry French queens or something like that, you know, I don't know the countries and all that, but why, for an alliance, because you know, if you have this guy or, you, you know, this woman's people, well, you know, if you're, she's your wife, you know, and all that kind of thing. And so, but, you know, God's people don't need alliances uh, because God's going to take care of them. And so here's a warning against that. And then, of course, go ahead. Oh, hmm. Prince Philip. Uh, Prince Philip today. I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I don't, I don't follow much history, but yeah, probably. Uh, of course, nowadays, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, of course, I'm thinking, uh, who's Prince Philip? Is that talking about uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Oh, oh, that guy. Yeah, that guy. That's right. Okay, that guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of one of uh, one of them boys, Princess Dies. So I don't know who they all are. I don't follow all that stuff, but yeah, uh, probably so. And of course, nowadays, monarchies, at least in the Western world, don't have as, uh, as much you know, umph as they used to have. Um, but, you know, like Saudi Arabia, places like that, they still do, you know. Yeah, it's just mainly PR, really. Well, that's true, yeah, sad thing. But yeah, but yeah, but, but th that is the point. Now, why, I don't know the background of that particular marriage, but a lot of times in history, uh, you know, where's Graham MacDonald when you need him? He could tell you all that stuff, but, you know, they would marry these other women to try to get alliances, but we don't need alliances with God and God's people don't need. In fact, when God's people started aligning themselves with the nations round about them, it was bad news. You know, you look at Kings and Chronicles later on, they'll start doing that, you know, to form an alliance with Egypt to fight Assyria or whatever, uh, but it's bad news. And then, of course, the uh, latter part of verse 17, nor shall they uh, greatly multiply silver and gold, obviously. Don't depend on wealth uh, because God is your source of wealth. Also, verse 18, uh, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. All right? That his heart may not be lifted above the brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand nor to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. All right, and so uh, there is a little silver lining in that dark cloud of kingship. If they will follow God, then God will bless them and so forth, and, and we kind of see that. Now, of course, you know, I'm thinking about the history, you know, when the king di uh, kingdom divided. Of course, you had three united kings. Uh, Saul will be the first here in just a moment. And then uh, David and Solomon, of course, Solomon with the wives and all that. Uh, and then the kingdom divided. And then, of course, in the northern kingdom, uh, remember the Jer Jeroboam's false system of worship that he set up. Uh, 1 Kings 12 uh, talks about that. But uh, there was not a single king of the north that ever got away from that. And there was only just a, a small handful, three or four, depending on how you look at that, uh, uh, kings of the southern kingdom that were faithful to God, or at least somewhat faithful to God. And so, um, you know, they went into, uh, both of those eventually went into captivity. Now, again, uh, God's timetable may not be what ours would be. He was definitely long-suffering with them, and he talks about that, and I'm sure we might get to some of that in some of these lessons here in the future. But he sent them prophet after prophet, tried to get them to turn away, sent plagues and all kinds of bad things upon them to try to get them to repent. Uh, but they still did not. They still refused. But if they would have, if they would follow God and his plan, he would be blessed. Or they, their kingdom and their land would be blessed. 
And uh, I think that same holds true today. If a people follows God and his principles, uh, they will be blessed. One of my favorite passages when it talks about this is Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but what? Sin is a reproach to any people. And so righteousness exalts. And so that's true even today. All right. But anyway, that's kind of a little background. And again, that's about 450 years before uh, Samuel and Saul come on the scene. And uh, Moses spoke about that way, or, yeah, way back then. All right. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Mm hmm. Brian, wasn't part of that problem as far as the people at some point looked around and saw all these uh, kingdoms around them? Yeah. Wasn't part of that brought on by the fact that they didn't fulfill what God told them to do as far as totally eliminating some of these <clears throat> kingdoms? Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll get into some more stuff here in 1 Samuel 8, but yeah, if. Yeah, when, when, when people are following God's plan, these problems don't arise, <laughs> okay? But when they don't follow God's plan, these problems arise. And that's a good lesson for us today. I mean, you know, uh, God has a plan for the way his church is to be organized, a plan for, you know, when, when we deviate against that, you know, sooner or later trouble comes. Uh, you know, God has a plan for marriage, you know, one man, one wife for life. Uh, but when we deviate from that, there's problems. And so anytime, you know, we deviate, and plus the, the verses we're going to read, and that's a very good point as a segue to the first part. You know, we're not going to get to ch uh, verse 10 yet, but we're going to get there in a moment. But the first part of Samuel, I think we're going to see some of that same type of thing. Now, of course, here there's, there's no king to compare. Oh, yeah, the second part of that, yeah. When they look around and see the nations and how they're working, it seems to be all good and cool and stuff, you know. And I uh, can't help but to do this. I do this every once in a while, but today I need to make sure it's on silent. But with this cell phone here, let me put that thing on silent. Uh, one of the things I think anyway in a analyzing, you know, when these kids got these cell phones and they're bored and they just look around, look what everybody else is doing. Hey, I'm not doing that. I should be doing that. You know, eh, I want to do this. I want to do that, you know. And, uh, but they see the nations around about them. But if they'd be busy in this or any of us would be busy in this or busy in something good, we're not sitting around bored. You know, I wish I could be like them, you know. And uh, there's a good thing, a lesson to be learned in that. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how to solve the cell phones. Get one like I've got. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Talk about mutiny. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> All right. But anyway, that's, that's the thing there. Yeah, before that, we didn't have that problem. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you know, before there were cell phones, there were still distractions. And, and people, people just haven't changed. I mean, you know, our environment, our technology, all that's kind of changed. But, I mean, the basic problems with humanity are still the same. And the basic solutions are still the same. God, you know, if we'll just uh, seek that. All right, but look at 1 Samuel 8. 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. Now, it came to pass when Samuel was old... Uh, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Uh, the name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second, uh, Abijah. They were judges in uh, Bathsheba. But here's a point, and this kind of goes along with what Frank brought up, at least uh, in principle. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. All right, and so the leaders that Samuel appointed were a bunch of no good, no good guys. They did not follow God. And I think that's very interesting because who, and of course this is brought up in the previous lessons uh, here, who brought up Samuel? Who raised Samuel for the most part? Eli. And how were Eli's sons? About the same, weren't they? Uh, and so... Um, you know, we're going to have one of the lessons in our uh, lectureship this year is uh, breaking sin's cycle in the family. Uh, because, you know, sometimes families grow up a certain way and they repeat the same sins. Uh, you know, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, that principle works both ways. You know, as a general rule, you train him up the way he should be, he won't depart from it as a general rule. But if you train him up the way he shouldn't be, he won't depart from it as a general rule. And again, Proverbs are not money-back guarantees. 100% of the time always occurs, but they're general principles. And I think we can see that in other Proverbs as well. But his sons were not what they should have been. And uh, 
and oh yes, very lesson, a uh, good lesson for us, those of us preacher types, that we can be so busy, and I know sometimes I'm so busy, that we neglect our family sometimes, and I need, <laughs> of course I got two sets of families, and uh, you know, and as a person gets older, gets busier, but we have to make sure we take time out uh, for that. But anyway, for whatever reason, it doesn't go on to say why. We usually don't think about this with Samuel. We think about it with Eli, but not with Samuel. But his sons weren't what they ought to have been either. And because they weren't, because there was all this turmoil, because there, the God wasn't being followed, notice the very next verse. Then the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. All right. Now, had Samuel's sons been godly leaders, I doubt that they would have had, came and asked this. You know, since they're, but notice, since your sons, look, your sons are not doing so. We want, we want to be governed like the nations round about us. All right. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And uh, Samuel prayed to the Lord. He took it to the Lord, which is a good, play, good thing to do. And I think we've observed this with his mother before. She took it to the Lord. And, and there you go, you know, train them up in the way they should go. And so he learned that from his mother at a young age. And, uh, of course, his mother still had contact with him at least once a year when she brought the coat that we've read about earlier. But the Lord said to Samuel, and again, this is something we need to realize as well, especially as preacher types, uh, and teachers, but he the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should reign over them. And that's, that's a slap to God's face, them asking a king. They have rejected me. Um, and when people reject the message that we preach, that we teach, whether we're preacher types or not, but they're not rejecting us, though they think that way sometimes. They think, you know, if they think that what we're teaching originates with us and not with them, they think we're, they, they may think they're just rejecting, you know, that's your opinion, that's your way, that's what you do. And I know it's very challenging for us to get that across to them that this is not what I say, what I think, what I, but this is what the Bible says. Uh, but when they reject that, they're really not rejecting us, but they're rejecting the Bible. They're rejecting God. And sometimes that's hard for us to, to realize. Um, but anyway, they have rejected me from, that I should reign over them uh, according to all the words which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also." Now, therefore, heed their voice, however, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. All right. And so, you know, sometimes God does. Sometimes we have to do that. Uh, remember the uh, the um, the loving father and the prodigal son uh, situation, you know, let them, you know, he demanded what what he wanted. And so the father gave it to him and sent him out. There comes a point when you have to, you know. Uh, loosen uh, the strings or loosen the leash or whatever let them do their thing and so he tells them go ahead and do that but don't do it without warning them now the, the new king james here says solemnly forewarn what does the other translations have on verse 9 first samuel 8 9 i didn't get a chance to check that solemnly for what's that well i think before that Show them the manner, okay. All right, I was looking for that solemnly forewarn. What's that? Protest. Okay, protest solemnly. Okay, it is right, protest, all right. But protest solemnly, or as this one has, forewarn them, all right. Here's what's going to happen. All right, now we pick up um, somewhere. Now we pick up <clears throat> with, um, with the reading here in the text, okay. Uh, and so Samuel told, yeah, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. Now, again, we just read what Moses said 400, about 450 years or so before this. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. 
He will appoint captains over his household and captains over his fifties, uh, will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment uh, of his chariots. And of course, uh, here Samuel warns the people, he tells them, but notice he tells them the word of the Lord. Again, not his own opinion, not his own thing, but the words of the Lord. Uh, and then also he continues, he will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and uh, give them to his servants. All right, and so what he's saying here is running a kingdom takes a lot of manpower, a lot of things, now, um, and people have to do that. And we're kind of used to this because we have all this kind of stuff in our society, jobs to do and all that. But again, if you think about before they had a king, who took care of all this ultimately? You know, God took care of all that. They still had the families, the clans. They still, you know, grew stuff and had livestock and all that. But the, um, the burden of fulfilling all that, I guess that's a way to say that, burden, uh, if the people were faithful, was God. God would take care of that. He would be the one that would, would fulfill all that when they were faithful. But now, with the king, you know, the king's got to have his coffers and all that uh, there as well. All right? Um, all right, but yes. Oh, yes. So that, um, you know, basically just telling them what Moses had said and that how that they would, uh, their sons and their daughters and their wives and all that would be labors now for the kingdom that would be established there. All right, and so he warned the people, but again, uh, we looked at that from, from Deuteronomy and uh, what uh, Moses said would happen a long time ago. All right, the next point, the family of Saul. Yeah, of all the good stuff in this chapter, but they picked these verses for the book here. Uh, but anyway, all right, so now we're going to go look for a donkey okay, or a bunch of donkeys. Okay, but anyway, all right, but the family of Saul. All right, now he does bring this up in the book here. Um, you know, the tribe of Benjamin was kind of wedged between um, Judah and Ephraim, and those Judah and Ephraim were kind of major tribes. Uh, a little bit of background here, Benjamin had just suffered a lot of loss uh, in, a, in a battle and so forth, uh, and so they were kind of small anyway, uh, the tribe of Benjamin, small and, and de they had recently been decimated. And so a king coming from this small little decimated tribe would not seem like too big of a threat, uh, you know, or, you know, it wouldn't seem like he'd be some kind of guy that would lord it over them or something like this. Uh, but he does go into the background of Samuel's family. Notice there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeor, uh, uh, Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, uh, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, okay? And so, you know, Saul comes from a pretty powerful family, if you will. And oh yeah, that mighty man of power. Um, so some, some translations, I don't think the King James, what does this say, a man of valor maybe? Uh, on that, the end of verse one, man of power. Does it have man of power? Yeah. Uh, man of power, okay. Uh, some of the translations may indicate power being wealth and riches, I'm not sure. But uh, he had a choice, uh, he had a choice and handsome son. All right, but anyway, a mighty man of power. He comes from a very influential family, influential, influential, influenza, no, influential family, okay. Um, uh, man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son, uh, whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. Uh, and what does the King James have for handsome? Anybody have that? Goodly, okay, goodly, all right, goodlier person, all right, and that was also said of Joseph, the patriarch Joseph, back in Genesis 39, uh, before Potiphar's wife, but anyway, whose name was Saul, this was not a more, uh, there was not, uh, from this, from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people, um, all right, let me just stop right there, man, he was taller, so he was a, you know, we might say a physical specimen, you know, tall, handsome, and um, especially in this day and age, go ahead. Uh, the English Standard Version has wealth. Or wealth. Okay, wealth. That's maybe where I heard that from. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's, that's one good thing about these phones here. You can get a Bible on there and all kinds of translations at your fingertips. Okay. Uh, but anyway, um, <clears throat> let me just stop right there. But especially in this day, and we mentioned this before, 
a leader, a king or something was really, a lot of it was a visual thing, you know. And as I mentioned, I think it was last week or the week before, back in the old days, the kings would actually go to battle. And it would be an encouragement to the soldiers for their morale to see the king on the horse with sword and shield in hand heading out to battle. And, uh, you know, the, just the presence of that. In fact, uh, just recently, and, uh, you know, I guess another good thing about Facebook, you get some historical stuff on there that's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, that, that, old, that picture of George Washington, you know, crossing uh, Valley, uh, Valley Forge, I guess heading to the battle on Christmas Day, wasn't it, or something like that? All the snow and the ice and all that stuff. I mean, that's pretty awesome when you think about that. You look at the history of that, uh, that's pretty awesome. And uh, George Washington, from what I hear, I obviously wasn't around in that day. I don't even think Jim was in that day. <laughs> but uh, uh, George Washington could have been the king of America. I mean, you know, uh, and that's what's so awesome about our founding documents, Constitution, uh, Bill of Rights and all that stuff, was to prevent that kind of thing from happening. And uh, a whole lot, of, whole lot of cool stuff on that. But um, I say all that to say that that... I have a lot more appreciation for George Washington going across that frozen river and half the soldiers didn't have shoes, but that, that was the only way he thought he could win, the element of surprise, because that British Army was a pretty powerful thing uh, in the world that time that he went up against, but that is pretty awesome by the grace of God that all that happened and made us the nation that we are. But I say all that to say that the physical presence of a king was something, and that's why Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, he usually pictures of him were on his horse, you know, because he was a little short guy, but anyway. Uh, but that was a physical thing. And when you think about even in our day and age, um, you know, they used to say, I don't know if there, there's something, there's some kind of thing, this comes up every presidential election, but I think the last couple of elections kind of blew that away, but usually it's, you know, the tall, dark, and handsome guy that wins. Um, but there's something about physical appearance, especially in a leader. Well, what does God think about that? Physical appearance. You know, later on, he'll tell Samuel, God looks on the heart. Okay, but, but here's uh, the, and as, as weird as this may sound, Saul was the perfect man for the first king of Israel. Okay, God planned it that way. Well, you know, the products of God and all that. But part of that was he was, uh, I don't know, I guess he was dark, but tall, dark, and handsome guy. Uh, head and shoulders above everybody, so he looked the part. Uh, now, we do later find out that he didn't really play the part very well, though he did in the beginning, but he looked the part anyway. All right, uh, verse 3 then, now the donkeys of Kish. Well, let me do this here. Mighty man of power, we talked about that. A choice and handsome one, we talked about that. And um, from the shoulders upward. All right, notice uh, the donkeys of Kish. Uh, now the donkeys of Kish, Saul, Saul's father, were lost. And uh, Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of uh, uh, Shalash, Shalash, but they did not find them. Uh, then they passed through the land of... Uh, I need to look at my little diacritical markings, but I don't know where that is. But anyway, uh, Shalem, and they were not there. And then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they, but he, uh, but they did not find them. And uh, when he had come to the land of Zuth, Saul said to a servant who was with him, "Come, let us return, as my father, uh, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us." In other words, we've been gone too long looking for these donkeys. And so uh, let's not worry my father anymore. Let's go back. And, of course, they had no way to know, knowing that, just common sense. We've been gone a long time. Can't find these donkeys. Uh, and he said to him, look now, there's in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. Now, later on, we know he's talking about Samuel here. Uh, so let us go there. Perhaps uh, he can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For God, uh, or for the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? Okay. Uh, and so here, man of God, again, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be Saul. And notice what it says about him. He is an honorable man. 
And, uh, and again, they didn't have CNN news or internet or anything, but they still knew about Samuel, the reputation of Samuel. And uh, they knew that uh, what he says surely comes to pass. We've talked about this. There was a, uh, you know, kind of a famine in the land of sorts of God revealing things to his people during the time of Eli. But when Samuel came along, God communicated a lot more with Samuel than others before him. Uh, and so word got out with all of that. All right. And the servant answered Saul and said, look, I have here at hand one fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God to, let, uh, to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Okay, And, uh, of course, a seer uh, emphasizes seeing visions. You know, that's why it's called a seer because he received his revelation from visions uh, and dreams and such. But uh, with Saul, with this word prophet, a prophet is just simply one who speaks on behalf of another. And so a prophet would speak, uh, God would reveal to him in words, though there were still visions and all that as well, but words, and then he would speak those words to others, all right? Now, one thing about um, this chasing the donkeys, I just kind of kind of mentioned that just in, in joking a moment ago, but one of the main things about this incident with the donkeys is to show the providence of God. Um, Saul has no idea at this point that he's going to be the next king. He's just out looking for his donkeys. There's nothing miraculous about this in the providence of God here, nothing miraculous about his donkeys being lost. Donkeys tend to do that. In fact, when I was in Ghana one time, we went to this little village, passing through this village in that region, they use donkeys a lot. You know, you have a donkey with a cart tied up to it, no person tending it. They, they're just there. And they know their master's voice and all that, and they'll tote stuff, tote people and all that. And every once in a while, they'll say a donkey just up and leave on his own. And he'll go, and he'll, he might be gone a year or two. And when he finds a, a home or wherever he goes, he'll just work for them for a while. But then after they've written that donkey off, a year or two later, he'll come back on his own and just pretend like nothing ever happened, you know, just right there. And, um, you know, that region of Ghana, that's what they did. And so it's probably the same type of thing here. But those donkeys were gone. But the point is, he's out looking for his donkeys. And uh, he's been out a long time, hadn't found them. He has no idea what Samuel's going to do to him when he finally finds him and reveals that he's the king. Uh, in fact, he's wanting to go back. But... They went to this, heard about this man of God who everything he says happens to come true. And so they went to him to figure out what to do and so forth. And so it is uh, the providence of God uh, as to what's going on here. All right. Any uh, questions or comments on that? All right. Here's some practical applications now. Let me, before I put mine on there, from these verses that we read this morning, what are some things that... Uh, come to mind that can help us in our daily lives? You know, what are some principles here? What's that? Rely on God. In fact, that's my first one here, I think. Yeah, well, basically there. Uh, God's ways are best, all right? No matter, as I mentioned in introducing this lesson, no matter what area of life, marriage, church, work, um, family, Children, adults, uh, whatever area, um, God's ways are best. Now, Proverbs 14, 12. Uh, let's see. We used to have, oh, yeah, there's a way that seems right uh, unto man, but the end thereof are what? The ways of death. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In other words, we think sometimes we know what's better. Uh, when it comes to these things in life and, and how to arrange things and all that. Now, there are some areas where, you know, you know, how we do dinner at my house may be different than how you did, do dinner at your house. But, you know, when it comes to how marriages should be, when it comes to how the church should be organized, when it comes to how families should be and heads of household, you know, who should be the head of the house and all that, well, we think our way is better sometimes. And sometimes the reason why those things get so out of whack and I always talk about this when I talk about role of women. One reason why the role of women is so out of whack some places is because men are a bunch of wimps and spiritual wimps and won't, won't do what they're supposed to do. And, uh, and when there's that void, 
people look somewhere else to fill it. And it doesn't justify, uh, you know, women getting up and preaching and song leading and all that in mixed assemblies like this. It doesn't justify that at all. But one reason why that starts, just like with Samuel's sons, if they would have been doing what's right and being godly leaders, there probably wouldn't have been that, you know, let's looking over here to the nations and seeing what they're doing and, make, and thinking that that's going to be better. Also, Jeremiah 10, 23. You got that? Lord, I know the way a man is Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not himself, is not in himself, it is not uh, in him that walketh to direct his past, but God is the one that does that. Uh, it's not up to us to direct our way. Um, yeah, we just talked about this sometime. Was it in here? I don't know. Let me see. I guess it wasn't in here. It was over at the school of preaching. Um, yeah, that was. We just finished our first week, by the way, yeah, since we've been back. But anyway, it just blows my mind how, um, like, you know, well, I just think about the atheist types um, who reject creation, uh, who, who just think you're such an ig ignoramus if you don't think the Big Bang happened, you know? But it's like, you know, in order for there to be a little ball of mass to explode, where did that come from? I mean, either way you look at it, you have to have something coming from nothing. And that just doesn't happen. I mean, that's just not logical. It's not rational. But yet they think they're all just all so smart and so educated. We just know so much. But yet that is just, just on a very foundational level, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20. Fire ish, but yeah, uh, it's just ridiculous. Uh, but yet we think we are just so beyond God that we're just so, you know. In fact, I think I mentioned this uh, in a sermon or something a month or two ago, but I heard this statement, and I haven't researched and all that, but it came from an archaeologist. But he said, uh, Archaeologists have never uncovered an ancient people who were atheists. I mean, they've covered, you know, they've uncovered polytheistic people, people who believe in many gods, monotheistic people, and so forth, but they have never come across a society that didn't believe in any god. But this would be the first. But really, it's not that they don't believe in God, but who is their god? Self. And when you, when you listen to their discussions and what they're promoting, it's all about, I'm God. And now they won't say it in those terms, but they think they are the omniscient ones. They are the all-powerful ones. Now, not miraculous way, but, you know, this religion stuff, this Christianity stuff is just a bunch of foolishness, a bunch of, you know, uh, one guy said a long time ago, I don't know who he is, op maybe it's Karl Marx, I don't know, opium for the masses. Opium for the masses. In other words, you can't deal with life, so just go find religion. And that's your drug. And the reason why people say that, just like with Samuel's sons, because Christianity, or at least, quote-unquote, hasn't been well represented in their world. And I've mentioned this, um, you know, before with Islam. One reason why Muhammad started that is because he looked at Judaism in his day. He said, that can't be from a, a God, a great, all-powerful God, loving God and all that. He looked at so-called Christianity in his day, which is really Catholicism, and he said, that can't be from God, so there must be something else. And so people have looked at, and I realize true Christianity is not either one of those, but when people see like Roman Catholicism or they see denominationalism and they think, well, if that's Christianity, I don't want nothing to do with it. There's got to be something better. Mm -hmm. That's like the, moron, the morons that think that there is such a thing as good Muslims. I mean, that we worship the same God. No, we don't. Yeah. Close. Right. Anybody who could read the Koran. Mm. It's just not the way it is. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of non-practicing Muslims that may fall in the category of being good neighbors and all that. But, yeah, if you really practice that and do it and, you know. Well, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, good Christians. Yeah, yeah. Are, you know, clean living too. Right, right. They're not, not yeah. Right. But, you know, you know there are a lot, yeah, a lot of people be good neighbors, but they're, they're not religious people. I mean, you know, but. Right. Yeah, no, no, mm -mm, yeah. It's a totally different God. It's a, it's a fabricated God, just like denominationalism has a different God than what the Bible talks about. And so, 
you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it may be the word, maybe the same word God, but it's not the same God, you know. It's definitely a different God. But God's ways are best, and I think that was our first bell. Also, uh, God does give us free will, you know. Uh, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, uh, God says, I've set before you the way of life and the way of death. He says, choose life. Uh, that you may live long in the land, okay? But it's a choice. Uh, just one of the basic definitions of human being is free moral being. We have a choice. Uh, God is not going to make us. Now, he's going to providentially set us up. He's going to do everything he can uh, that we find him, but he is not going to make us serve him. He's not going to make us do what's right. Because if, if he made us do what's right, uh, we, we wouldn't be human. But he wants us to love him on our own. He wants us to make that choice, that deliberate, I want to follow God. And uh, so he gives us free will. You know, Joshua, the famous statement of Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods of the Amorites or the gods of the, uh, the people in the land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the God. We're going to serve God. But choose you this day. He gave him a choice. Uh, but the right choice is God. All right? Uh, mm -hmm. Choice has gone too far. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm the only one who read it, but now they have decided that there should be a school from kindergarten to 12th grade for the gay, oh. uh, transsexual community, children. Now, who, what moron has decided that a five-year-old would be... Oh, man. Age, ...can decide what gender they want. Yeah. Oh, man, don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's true, man. That's oh, I know. I oh, man. When, and it, you may not believe this because you are too young to know about it, but back in the day, Ingrid Bergman the famous Hollywood star, was run out of Hollywood for having an illegitimate child. And now it's rampant. Yeah. Yeah. Like a 12, 12 13-year-old kid comes and tells you, I'm bi. Yeah. Man, you know, get out of here. You don't even know what that is, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. No, don't give a story. Anyway, let's stick to this, okay? Uh, oh, yeah. Here we go. Boink. All right. Uh, seek reliable. There you go. Seek reliable spiritual advice. Um, and, of course, this was at the end of that reading we had, there's a man of God uh, who what he says comes to pass. And so they were going to go there to find advice. And, um, of course, the best source of advice is obviously the scriptures, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures given by the inspiration of God, etc. But look at Titus 2, and the bell will probably catch us as we're reading Titus 2. But look at Titus 2, uh, 1 through 5, uh, Titus 2, 1 through 5. Uh, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, lo uh, in love and patience, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they, uh, but that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. But notice they are to teach the younger. And uh, a lot of times we want to go to advice. Oh, man, I think, I think actually uh, Hiram had a lesson on this about three or four or five months ago. We, we, we want to take our advice from people who think like we think, people who are going to justify what we want to do and so forth, and uh, rather than people who would guide us in the right way. And so uh, we need to, to learn that. All right, well, we're out of time here. Appreciate uh, your attention. Uh, as we study this great topic.